The US FDA is poised to take an unprecedented regulatory action. The agency has requested that Pfizer submit the results of a randomized controlled trial of children six months to four years old of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The interesting thing about this is this randomized trial initially had a primary endpoint of non-inferior antibody titers, actually the integrated geometric mean antibody titer. Basically what they're saying is, show me that in these kids at this age with this dose, you can generate antibody titers consistent with what older kids have been able to get from their vaccine dose. And if you do that, winner, winner, chicken dinner, you're gonna get your drug approval, you're gonna get your emergency use authorization. Now, interestingly, back in December, Pfizer announced that they fell short of this metric. They didn't hit the bar. They were unable to generate non-inferior antibody titers. And in fact, they generated slightly inferior antibody titers. Now there's a couple of things they could have done in response. One of the things Pfizer could have done is gone back to the drawing board, slightly increased the dose. We can talk, and perhaps there could be a longer video on why they picked the three microgram dose, and maybe they should have tried some things in between three and 10, but they could have gone back and done a slightly higher dose, done two, two doses and tried to hit their endpoint. But of course they have a trial that's already ongoing. So the easier thing for Pfizer to do is just add a third dose. And that's in fact what they did. And so they're still pursuing the same primary endpoint, which is getting that antibody titer where we think it ought to be. Then interestingly, we hear reports now, the Surgeon General has told Meg Terrell that it's possible that this study, although it has failed to meet this initial primary endpoint, there's a difference in symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 between the two arms of the study. It sounds like there might be about 100 cases, and there might be some difference between the kids who got vaccinated having fewer cases than the kids who didn't. And the FDA has asked Pfizer to submit the results and maybe grant EUA. So maybe we'll give you the EUA now with, for two doses, and maybe sometime down the road we'll ask for that third dose. Now, this is going to be one of the most interesting and controversial regulatory actions in a long time. Let me walk you through my thinking. One, I think different people can disagree. But in my opinion, I think giving Pfizer the opportunity to get this vaccine in this age group based on a non-inferior antibody titer, that's already giving them a very low bar. It's not asking them to prove too much. You don't have to prove to me you reduce severe disease, which is what I would have liked to see as the primary endpoint of the study. That would have taken a much larger sample size because kids this age generally do well. You don't even have to show a reduction in symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. That's what the initial randomized controlled trial in adults showed. Here, they're going to take a non-inferior antibody titer. And to me, that's a too low a bar. Even for EUA, it's far too low. And in the British Medical Journal, previously with colleagues Wes Pegden and Steph Burrell, I had some thoughts about whether or not the EUA should even be the preferred regulatory pathway for this, or if we should use a BLA, which is a more traditional vaccine approval standard. But put that aside. Having said what the primary endpoint of the study is, I think you have to stick to your word. You have to stick to what you think is the primary endpoint. There can be lots of secondary endpoints that are different between the two arms, but the purpose of a primary endpoint is to prevent you from the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, which is you shoot at a wall and then afterwards you draw the bullseye around what you hit. And that's always a worry when you start picking and choosing among secondary endpoints, because maybe there's a reduction in symptomatic cases, but maybe there might have been a reduction in severe cases, but not symptomatic cases. And if you're allowed to draw the bullseye there, then maybe you could call it a winner. It introduces a problematic component to clinical trials, and it's not consistent with the FDA's philosophy. There's some additional things that I think are interesting here. One, as you all know, the mRNA construct is to an ancestral strain of the virus. It's not to Omicron. It's to the older ancestral strain. And so the antibodies it generates they do have some impact on symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. We've seen that at least three vaccine effectiveness studies, but it appears to be modest, not as good as for the ancestral strain, and transient. It appears to wear off after some time. So the question is, by children using this vaccine, will they get durable immunity or will it be a transient phenomenon? Now that transience plays a role in this study. The study, of course, was running last year. That's when it started. And while they're running the study, the predominant wave, I think, is Delta then Omicron comes. It will be very interesting to see how many cases of symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 are Delta and how many are Omicron. What's the vaccine effectiveness for Delta and for Omicron? Because Omicron's what we care about now. That's, the, that's what we're fighting right now. That's the current strain. It might be something different in the future, but that's where we are right now. The next question is, when you give the second dose, there's gonna be a period of time where you get some Omicron protection, but it's gonna fade. Did this study collect endpoints during that sweet spot period of time, that transient effectiveness against Omicron study? That's gonna be really important to think about because we wanna know this has durable immunity for these kids, not just transient immunity. The other thing is, what were the kids doing during this time? Was this the winter holiday testing bonanza where everybody, everybody you know, was testing themselves and their kids to go travel and visit relatives? 
And if it was in that setting, you very likely could be finding a whole bunch of asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 that just happened to be tested for because people were aggressively testing. And that coincides with the Omicron surge. You put these things together and you're talking about an endpoint, even symptomatic SARS-CoV-2, that may not be the clinical endpoint you wish it were. It might be an opportunistic endpoint that happened to occur during an era of intense surveillance when Omicron was there that happened to hit the wave of when you get the vaccine immunity against Omicron, which may wane over time. You put all this together, you might get a delta on that symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 in this time period for this age group with this study, but it might not be enough to tip the regulatory decision. I'm going to be very interested in what the, the, the vaccine advisors think about this. I also want to point out, let's say this company is able to show you a reduction in hospitalization from SARS-CoV-2. I don't think they're going to be able to do that because the sample size is not going to give you any power to see that. You might have just a handful of cases in both and a confidence interval so wide you could park a school bus in it. So I don't think they'll be able to get there. But even if they were to get there, you need to ask yourself how many of those kids were hospitalized for SARS-CoV-2 and how many were with SARS-CoV-2? Because we know we are screening everybody on entry to the hospital. And if you get a vaccine that does transiently blunt your ability to harbor the, no the virus in your nose, it will show a reduction in hospitalization with SARS-CoV-2, but it might not show a reduction in hospitalization from SARS-CoV-2. It will certainly change the numbers of raw hospitalizations where somebody tested positive, but did it actually change the disease course? And that's an important question. What do we want from a kid's vaccine? It's very simple. We want a vaccine that you give to kids that has a good safety profile that makes them less likely to suffer bad outcomes from this virus. It has to be pertinent for the virus you're dealing with, Omicron and whatever future strain comes. It has to be somewhat durable. It can't just be a, a blip. It can't be a short burst, a, a, a flash in the pan. It has to be durable. And it has to be something that actually averts the bad outcomes you care about. When you start getting into studies that didn't hit the primary endpoint, that was already a low bar, and you start looking at secondary endpoints, you start having the luxury of picking all the time points you can look at, you're getting into low credibility science. The last point I'll make, we know from the five to 11 year old vaccine approval or authorization, EUA, sorry, EUA, in the five to 11 year old group, we know. Okay, let me finish my last thought. What I wanted to say is this. When we talk about kids five to 11, we know from current data that there's a fraction of people that are gonna be exuberant and rush their kids to get vaccinated. And there are gonna be some blue state places that impose mandates God, I hope they don't because that would be a mistake. But there are going to be places that are exuberant to do it. But it's about 20%. That's where it plateaus. And then the rest of the 80% of people, they're not going to rush to do this because that appears where vaccination is plateauing for 5 to 11. And so what you want with your vaccine authorization, your, your regulatory action, what you want is to make sure you don't lose the trust of American people. You want the buy-in of the American people. And what we see now is you got 20% buy-in. I worry that if you start basing your regulatory actions on non-primary endpoints of studies that failed the primary endpoint, you will not get more than 20%. You might only get 10% or 15%. And that might be a big problem because it might make it a hell of a lot harder to get the rest of people, even if you subsequently later generate better data. So I think you've got to be very careful here. We're not just talking about one vaccine in isolation. We're talking about a body politic that is stressed, that is tired, that is I think to some degree sick of mandates. And if you push on them too hard, you might not like what they do and you might pay a big price. So I continue to believe that the administration has made a few errors along the way. They are focusing so much energy and so much power on what we're going to do for the lowest risk people in society with masking mandates for kids and pushing these vaccines and boosters at young ages that some other European nations are not doing. And they're do spending so little energy on the most vulnerable people older people in nursing homes, older people who are unvaccinated, nursing home patients who are not boosted, that's where I would focus all of my energy because those people are going to be severely hurt by subsequent pandemic waves and subsequent pandemic spread. So that's it. That's this video. If you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. This is about the impending regulatory action. I'm going to follow it very closely. I'm going to follow those advisory hearings. And if, if I, I hope to hear what I like to hear. So on that positive note, until next time.